I love so many things about North Dakota, and one of the things I love the best is how anxious we are to help one another. You, you see it all the time. Uh, you've seen the traffic jams at entryways when you're trying to, to go into a restaurant or a building as people stop to hold the doors open for one another. If you've ever stopped alongside one of our roads to take a picture or a phone call or to change a tire, you've probably had multiple people stop just to make sure you don't need any help. Another way North Dakotans can show kindness to their neighbors is by getting vaccinated. Vaccinations keep vulnerable people safe from severe illness and death. They keep our economy running by keeping our businesses open. They help us stay mentally healthy by allowing us to connect with others through church events or community groups. They also keep our healthcare workers safe and on the job. Getting vaccinated is a choice you can make to help your neighbors, your community, and your state. So talk to your doctor about it and follow their advice to get the vaccinations that will help keep you and all the people you care about healthy and happy. To learn more, go to spreadlovenotcovidnd.org, a website set up by the North Dakota State University Center for Immunization Research and Education. Get three months of local news for just 99 cents a month. You'll get unlimited access to the news you need to stay engaged and connected to your community. Visit inforum.com slash subscribe now to get three months of local news for only 99 cents a month. Welcome to Plain Talk. And one of the debates that are going to be going on in Bismarck at the legislature's debate over tax relief, which, you know, we have a version of that debate every session. Um, this one comes down to two plans. Um, well, probably more than that. But but really, I, I think two competing ideas. One is a uh, reduction of the state income tax. Um, it's an elimination of the tax for the bottom 60% of, of income earners. They have a zero rate. Uh, and then the other rate is everybody above, uh, what is it, like 54, 55,000. I think if you're a single filer, um, they would pay like a point and a half. Um, the other is a property tax buy down plan, which would use legacy fund revenues to to try to lower the legislature, essentially send more money locally to try to buy down property taxes again. But we're going to today focus on the income tax, because in, in my talking about it, I have complained about some of the people making a comparison saying it's just a handout for the wealthy. And I didn't like that very much. And I had some I had some tough words probably about that. And now one of the people um, I was saying those words about is joining us on the podcast, Representative Zach Ista. He's a Democrat from Grand Forks. Zach, are you doing? I'm doing well, Rob. Thanks for welcoming. I, I think it was left wing enemy of income tax cuts. Uh, yeah, was that I'm was glad that to it? be here to I may defend have, my position. I may have used the term enumerate too, although I think that was that was aimed <laughs> maybe at Tony Bender and not you. Uh, also joining me, of course, is Ben Hansen, former Democratic lawmaker himself, uh, who is my co-host uh, when we do these podcasts on Wednesdays and sometimes other days too. Um, and, and looking forward to having a team up on Rob for once on yeah. the ideological side of the aisle. Yeah, that's right. That's right. These two are going to tag team me. So, Zach, I, I think maybe I'll, I'll restate my argument for, for the audience. I understand that there are, are, are reasonable arguments to made about, be made about the income tax plan. And frankly, some, some which give me qualms as well. I worry sometimes when we look at, at the base of revenues that our state uses to do all the things that we want our state to do, I sometimes worry that we're going to narrow it so much that we're too dependent on, on oil taxes. You know, that's one example. And I realize the, num the amount of oil taxes that flow into the general fund are limited, but oil activity drives a lot of other. Oil activity drives a lot of sales taxes. Oil activity drives a lot of income taxes. I worry that we become too dependent on these things. Um, I worry about if the tax cuts, we're such a commodity driven economy. If we cut taxes too much, are we going to be able to bounce back in the future? I understand those arguments. I don't necessarily find them persuasive enough from, to deter me from supporting the tax plan put forward by Governor Bergam and other lawmakers. But one argument that really drives me nuts, because I don't think it's founded in reality, is the idea that these tax cuts are just a handout to the wealthy. And that's that's quoting you. I'm going I'm to quote you now. This is from the Democratic NPL press release that was sent out when that plan was announced. It says, uh, I quote, this is from Representative Vista, I'll work with anyone to lower taxes for hardworking North Dakotans who need it most, but this proposal is just another giveaway to the wealthy. Worse, it fails to address the real problems that keep North Dakotans up at night. It does nothing to solve the state's child care crisis, et cetera, et cetera. Now, I, I say et cetera, et cetera, because those parts of your argument, while maybe I don't find them persuasive, 
I, I think are valid, right? Like if we say, well, if, if we cut revenues, we won't have revenues to do these other things. Whether I like that argument or not, I, I think that's valid. Why are you calling this a giveaway to the wealthy? I just don't see when, when it's cutting taxes for the bot, like 60% of North Dakotans at the bottom of the income scale will pay zero under this plan. How is it a giveaway to the wealthy? Well, you're, you're right, Rob. And, and the governor's right. 60% of North Dakotans under this plan would see a zero dollar state income tax liability. But when you get numbers, and I asked for these from our legislative council, they got them from the tax department. That pencils out to about a $220 average benefit per filer in that 60% of North Dakotans. That's nice, uh, but you're probably getting a paycheck every two weeks if you're in that 60%. That's eight or nine bucks every paycheck. That probably isn't moving the economic needle for, for too many families. I don't think it's a difference maker to encourage non-residents to move to North Dakota and, and help meet our workforce crisis uh, there. Uh, but when you look at the numbers for the current highest tax bracket, those are people with income north of a half million dollars a year. The numbers I got show that they get an average annual benefit of over $36,000. Uh, and, and that's what I mean when I say this plan is, is really uh, tipping the scales too heavily in favor of the wealthiest North Dakotans. There's, there's that $220 benefit on the 60%, 36000 sure. on that upper 3% but, of but North Dakota here, filers. Here's, here's where I have a problem. And, and so, sorry to interject, Ben, but it was I, – I, I, just, I just want one quick follow-up on that because – I feel like if that's the argument you're going to make, you can make it about any tax relief anywhere, right? We say, well, we're going to reduce the number of mills that we levy for the park district or something. You could say, well, that benefits the wealthy because wealthy people own bigger houses and more expensive property. Therefore, because the mill rate's going down, they're going to they're going to have a, a larger dollar amount reduction in what they pay than someone who maybe owns a more modest piece of property. Um, or the sales tax. You could say, well, I'm going to reduce the sales tax by a point. Well, rich people buy more expensive things and they spend more money. So their dollar amount reduction from the sales tax is going to be more than someone who has less disposable income. You know, if, if that's the argument we're going to make, of course, people, somebody who's making, you know, the, the, what, what, what is the state media now? Like around $40,000 a year, someone making $40,000 a year, of course, is going to see less benefit from an income tax cut than somebody who's making a million dollars a year. That's just reality. I, I don't. I don't understand how you get there. Well, well, Rob, one of the reasons I think the income tax is is a good tax policy generally. And remember, the proponents of this have made it their express goal to eliminate the income tax yeah. entirely. I'm super excited uh, in, about in, it. in the near future. <laughs> One of the benefits of the income tax is it's always been based on this sort of progressive uh, scale where the more you make, the higher your rate is. Sure. And I think we've got a level set a little bit in North Dakota. Nobody, no matter how wealthy they are, pays more than 2.9% uh, tax rate on their, on their personal income tax in North Dakota. So we're not California, New York. We don't have some massive state Agreed. income tax that we have to have to just cut. You can cut income tax without it disproportionately uh benefiting the wealthiest filers. Uh, for instance, you could take the proposal we have, the Bergen proposal, the Chairman Hedlund proposal, and just zero out that tax liability for the 60% of North Dakotans and leave every other rate stable, leave it where it is today. That would be a way to provide some income tax relief to the majority of North Dakotans without uh, an additional benefit to the wealthy. So you don't have to just cut rates across the board. You can target this tax relief to the working and middle class families who I think could benefit most from it. And you, you mentioned at the, the start, you know, there's another income tax proposal out there. We heard it the same day in our tax committee. This is from Representative Pat Heiner, a Republican from Bismarck. That would extend what we did in the special session in 2021, an income tax uh, credit. Uh, your, your listeners might remember uh, and have appreciated their taxes. There was a $350 credit for single filers, a $700 credit for married filers, for this two years uh, yeah. when we met for the special session. Representative Heine proposes, let's extend that for another two years, but increase uh, the value to ben, $750. Ben, 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 is, ben is charming a bit here. I, I, I don't want to compare too much because I don't think a credit is tax reform. I, I think the debate before us is tax reform. A credit's not reform. The credit's just giving people money and, and not even necessarily their own money, um, sometimes other people's money, depending on their tax situation. But I, I think the credit is not comparable to tax reform. What, what, what Burgum's proposing is a structural change 
in the tax code. So I don't think those ideas are competitive. Anyway, I'll let Ben talk now, finally. But Representative Vista, the other explicit intent on behalf of the governor that he has spoken about many times and the proponents of this bill is to attract more workers to the state of North Dakota because we have, depending on who you talk to and what time of year it is, 40,000-ish jobs available. What I'm quoted here in the Fargo-Moorhead market where I live is that, and admittedly it's Cross River too, we have over 4,000 positions in the state of North Dakota that pay more than $70,000 per year that can't get, uh, haven't been filled in, have been open for over a year. Well, my question to you is, and actually more so for the proponents of the bill, what evidence has been produced that this moves the needle uh, when folks are considering the factors of moving to a state when, yes, the states of Texas and Florida are two of those states that do not have income tax, so is the state of Wyoming, so is the state of South Dakota. I don't see people flocking there in any you know, way that develop, uh, can lend itself to be a trend. Why are we jumping on that train? Or why, why is the governor watch up on that train? Has that been answered? The short answer, no. And the governor and supporters had an opportunity to cite statistics, bring in families who, but for the income tax, would be you know packing up their cars and moving to North Dakota. Businesses that, but for the income tax, would move to North Dakota tomorrow. The workforce crisis is multidimensional, and the solutions to it have to be multidimensional uh, as, as well. I think Okay. You know, okay, but but a, we're but we're being a little I think facetious. The governor's halfway there, but like when we're looking at this, and you look at similar states with similar populations, economies, even geography. Frankly, I just don't see the movement there and the emphasis here. When you look at a roughly two hundred dollar savings per year versus the top end thirty six thousand dollars saving a year, I, I you know in, in income tax to the state, I just I don't understand it. I don't understand how those people are going to be attracted here when they could be earning that much somewhere else or they could be moving here for a myriad of other factors. I, that, that's right, Ben. I think we have to, you know, your average family considering whether to uproot and move to North Dakota, a one or two percentage difference in their income tax rate is, is not likely to be the deciding factor. They're going to have to look at the cost of living overall in the state. What other taxes are they paying? What sort of earning opportunities do they have in the state? You talk about Florida and Texas. Most of the year, we can't compete with them, uh, you know, in terms of climate, in terms of weather. So it's really those multi-factor decision makings. You, you might be able to find one or two families that are making those sophisticated calculations at a percentage point here or there. Uh, changes this. I don't think it's going to solve and fill those forty thousand okay. openings you cited earlier. Okay, so, my so, so, so well, hold, hold on, hold on, hold on here, hold on here. Yeah. My I, my problem with everything you guys are just talking about is it's premised on the idea that the only thing anybody's putting forward, and we're all pretending like this is the magic bullet. If we pass the income tax reform, it's the magic bullet that's going to get everybody. Nobody's saying that. What we're saying is that, is that we that. have to we have I to make. I disagree with that. I feel we, like the governor's saying that. No, I, I no, he's really not. Does. He has not said it's the magic bullet. I, I, I would, I would, if he's been saying that, then that's a tactical mistake on his part. We have a, we need a multi-front approach to this. But the problem is, income tax can be one part of that. And I don't understand why we would say, well, because it's not the magic bullet, because it's not the thing that will will put people over the top and get them to move here. Therefore, we shouldn't do that. I think that's silly. I think that's foolish. I think that's a reductive, simplistic way of looking at a very serious policy proposal. Also, remember that one of the well, reasons why income taxes are so low now is because we've been consistently cutting them over and over again for a long time now. And I, I would I would remark, although I am hesitant to say there's a one-to-one -one comparison here, I would also note that our state is currently at record levels of population. Our population's never been higher. And that happened in the context of us reducing income tax. Now, there were a lot of other factors there, not least of which was obviously what was happening out in the oil patch. A lot of jobs were available. A lot of high salaries were available. That was attracting a lot of people to our state. But listen, there's there's a lot of things that hold people back from moving to North Dakota. We can't do anything about the weather. Sometimes we can't really do anything about the perception that that you know, North Dakota is a boring place to live and not a lot happens here culturally. I think that's unfair, but unfortunately, that's the perception a lot of people have. It's tough to fight those things, but we can do some things and income tax is one of them. I don't know why that's such why everybody gets so hung up on that. Well, well Rob, I think if, if we're having a conversation about tax reform and, and I'm going to put on my attorney hat here, I think the burden of proof is on those who are trying to change the system. You know, we heard in our tax committee from conservative Republican Representative Sue Ann Olson. She represents areas around Bismarck, Emmons County. 
And, and she talked about the, some of these concerns as well, that she works as an accountant. She does taxes for a living. Nobody is coming to her, she told us, to complain about their income tax burden in North Dakota. Yeah. And she's got the skepticism that's going to move the needle on people coming here. So, okay, so, so if, this, it's isn't not, a, if it's, this isn't a workforce solution, then what is the case for it? And, and I think it's an ideological case. There are some that those billions of dollars that believe of, it's and surplus well, tax is appropriate. And Rob, I would add to that, that where is the urgency when you're saying we're at our peak level of population in the state right now, if the impetus is to move people here. Tens of thousands of unfilled jobs. Tens of thousands of unfilled jobs. But is that truly going to be a factor that brings? It's one. I I think it can be one factor. And and here's here's the problem. I I think to Representative Sue Ann Olson's point, you know, part of what there's kind of a triangulation game going on here is say, well, nobody wants income tax reform. Everybody wants property tax relief. We have the legislature has spent and I'm using that word spent. Right. Because the legislature doesn't levy the property tax. All the legislature can do is try to buy down the property tax or I guess cap it in some ways, although there's there's I, I don't know that caps are the right solution. But we have passed more than seven billion dollars in property tax relief, I think, since the 2007 session that the tax commissioner, Brian Cross, has told me that earlier this week. Seven billion dollars. People are still upset about their property taxes. So here's what I'm afraid of. I think the people who are triangulating about property tax relief are going to use it to kill the income tax reform. And then we're going to get another stupid buy down that doesn't move the needle at all on property taxes. Because look at the $7 billion in buy downs the legislature's already done. And everybody's still upset about their property taxes. I'm not convinced that this legislature can, can effectively reduce property taxes. I don't think it's possible. And I think because the legislature doesn't levy the property tax. Well, and the other aspect of property tax is not just we don't levy it or we can buy it down. We need to remember that the policies we do pass impact the amount of property taxes local governments do levy. The the amount we fund our schools, the investments we make in infrastructure. And one big problem I have with the flat tax proposal is it's a permanent uh, $566 million reduction in state revenues every budget cycle forever and ever. Because we won't roll it back if we implement it. So what does that do to our counties, our cities, our park districts? If the state now has a half billion dollars off the table to fund things that might be a priority, does the burden then fall on those local governments to have to look at their property tax levels to fund the services that their constituents uh, expect and deserve the government to do? You're absolutely right. Representative Olson's right. All of this has to be viewed sort of holistically. And that's why I think just taking a half billion dollars in revenue off the table, our most stable source of revenue, one that doesn't fluctuate uh, depending on the price of oil, uh, is I, a way to I have would, some sort I would, of long-term boy, I, budget. I would, I would disagree you, with that. The income tax fluctuated quite a bit when oil prices dropped and all those oil workers left the state. It does fluctuate quite a bit. But you, you're right. It's probably more stable than the And other. I would argue that when we take, to Representative Issa's point, when we take that, that revenue off the table permanently and we still have the expectations, take school districts because it tends to be the headline getter and people care about their kids for good reason – if their kids are in public school, we expect them to be able to go to those schools, have a building to go to. West Fargo School District, they're building a new elementary school every single year here just because of population explosion. And it's a good problem to have, but it is a challenge. Uh, they expect to have up-to-date facilities, teachers to be paid to and have a, a degree of quality to have a quality education. When you as a legislature walk away from some of those revenue sources if they're not funding that. And I don't disagree that the buy downs have been a little bit uh, shaky in their effectiveness for what the end result is. But you're unfortunately, you're passing on a soft mandate to those school districts when the state doesn't have the income uh, to do it. When you're taking away tools from yourself and you're gradually disarming, you're setting up a less diversified portfolio for later. You just are. And I appreciate that the governor has been consistent now putting his foot down saying, listen, if you want to reduce these property taxes, you need, if you really want to do local control, you need to talk to your local officials, you need to get involved with your local elections, yeah. you need to get involved if, with your school board. That's fantastic. But then pretend, and it's a disciplined, not necessarily always popular stance to take. And I actually do applaud him for that. But this on the other end is not setting us up for success in the future. And and Representative Vista, we're now at kind of a peak right now, economically speaking. Have there been any forecasts of how this income uh, cut would affect the state's uh, ability to fund the various buckets like the school sustainability fund for the future? Have there been like the worst case scenarios? Because that's what I feel the state should be prepping for when looking at any kind of tax policy. 
Yeah, Ben, we're waiting on analysis. The state state bank of North Dakota uh, can do a regional economic model to sort of take the holistic view of uh, if we if we change tax in this way, what does it do for growth? What does it do for state revenues? What does it do for future uh, budget outlooks? So we're waiting to see those numbers. Uh, our, our budget uh, drafters, our appropriators are setting their economic uh, projections, I think, just today. So we'll see where they set their baselines at. But but I, I don't want to move past this point of a, a, our current financial reality versus planning for the, for the future. Like, look, we, we have a very rosy budget forecast as we sit here in, in 2023. Uh, you know, I think the governor has and, and, and can take credit for policies that, that have led us to that point. But it's also buoyed by high sales tax revenue currently, high commodity prices, a uh, high amount of federal dollars that have come through the various COVID relief packages. So when we're talking about new investments in the state, the mantra we keep, keep hearing is one-time investments, that, that shovel-ready road, bridge, water project, whatever it might be. Well, maybe we should look at that on the tax relief side, too. Should we do one-time tax relief that, that matches the current rosy robust finances of our state, a form of a tax credit versus one that is a permanent reform when when I don't think we have a broken income tax system that needs reform at this time. So I, I think it's a way to match a current reality and and preserve that flexibility for the legislature. Because because look, I, I, I don't want Democrats to get painted here as, as not supporting tax relief. When we have the mm. financial situation North Dakota currently does, we absolutely should be finding ways to send money back in to North Dakotans. Well, I, I, well I, I mean, if Democrats don't want to get painted that way, then maybe you should support some tax relief. That's an actual reduction in what people pay in taxes and not just more spending, because that's what the property tax bailouts have been over and over again. And by the way, if there's if we're concerned about like like what the income tax is going to mean for fun, for property tax, like we reduce the if that's the argument, we're reducing the income tax. So that's going to put more pressure on local governments because they're going to get less funding from the state. Why haven't property tax gone down when we've given local governments seven billion dollars since 2007? The legislature has taken over, what, 80 percent of education funding now. We have been shoveling money at the locals. Have property tax now? I think it's eighty percent. Is that maybe Representative Vista can? Well, this, but this is the sh- this sort of the, the 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 finger pointing game everybody likes to well, point. Sure, at each it other. is the, the locals. The locals the, like to the, have the legislature, the local government. These property taxes seem seem to be the white whale we try to solve legislative. I, I understand that. I, I'm going to watch with interest. I think it's uh, Senator Shively, Representative Nathy have a plan that's that's moving through the Senate process. Let's hear what that testimony is. Is let's hear what the stakeholders have to say make the argument that this time it, it will be different. I think, Rob, you express frustration that a lot of uh, property owners express that that th- for all this relief, uh, they're not they're not feeling it. My bill is not books. going but, down. But, but 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 I don't I, I don't know why we're so quick to, to diminish the, the notion of a tax credit. If you look at the numbers of the proposal of Representative Heinert, more people will have a zero dollar tax liability than the flat tax proposal under here. It is a way to get money directly back into yeah. taxpayers' well, one, pockets. One, one, one reason here. Let me quote your uh, your minority leader, Representative Josh Boucher, in the same press release uh, I, I quoted earlier in the show. He said, "We are open to discussing support for continued temporary tax relief while balancing the other priorities." North Dakotans, we need long term tax stability. So I, I don't know. I, I feel like that's if we're going to do tax reform, we should give people. Stability, not one-time credits that may or may not happen from biennium to biennium. If we're if we're intent on tax relief, then let's give permanent tax relief that's lasting that I could plan on every year. That's what I would like, um, and I at least insofar as Representative Boucher said that, I agree with him. And the other thing we can't ignore, by the way, is the fact that we have enormous reserves. And I'm not just talking about the legacy fund, which is kicking off what, a half billion dollars in revenue now per budget cycle? We also have the Common School Trust Fund, which I haven't looked at it recently, has billions of dollars in it, kicking off hundreds of millions of dollars in revenues. I think there are ways that we could use the revenues from those to offset ta- tax burdens for North Dakotans while still funding schools and, and infrastructure and the other things that we need to fund. I, I think this is within our grasp to do in a sustainable way that is resilient to the obvious ups and downs of our of our commodity, very commodity driven economy. Well, it, stability isn't just in tax policy. It's in the services that North Dakotans have come to expect uh, roads, bridges, things like that. I think South Dakota has been a cautionary tale. They have uh, seen a similarly short term economic 
picture that's been good, but now they are concerned about a, a smaller surplus, perhaps even having budget challenges as soon as uh, two or four years from now. We have to just be cautious always when we have a large chunk of our revenues and, and our state's economy that is locked into our oil fields in the western part of the state, it is hard for us to make long-term stable plans given the volatility of that market. So that's why I favor an approach that is responsive to the temporary uh, good econo economic times we find ourselves in rather than boxing us in long-term uh, to an area where it may come down a session two, four, six years from now where all of a sudden we have to make sharp and sudden budget cuts, uh, and that's going to impact families too. And the exact same thing happened in Kansas under Governor Brownback after he was a U.S. senator. The, it was taken so far to the brink on the other side with a revenue cut because it was, you know, under the excuse that no one likes to pay taxes, but it actually wound up being a blowback and a bit of a schism within the um Kansas GOP. But Representative Ista, I want to mention something to you. We had Congressman Kelly Armstrong on last week, and he said something that, unfortunately, both of us can relate to a little bit, which is it's easy to vote no in the minority, right? You don't, you're technically not, uh, you're supposedly not in charge of governing, but I know that you do look at this job with an eye of responsibility for uh, how it's going to impact all North Dakotans outside of the whatever games go on the state capitol. I, I did want to ask you, I know that you have a vision. I'd like to hear what would your vision be, say, no one no one individual, including Craig Headland, controls the tax committee, but say you're able to set the agenda at, in a majority, what would, the a, a, say, a Democrat majority do to be helping out regular North Dakotans during this legislative session, given where we're at financially? Great question, Ben. And, and some of the priorities we have is how do we lower all costs for working class, middle class North Dakota families? The tax piece is just one one part of that. Uh, but there's the child care discussion that's been going on for the last year. Or so how can we lower those costs? This this is something that affects my family personally. It's, you know, uh, over a thousand dollars a month for each of our kids. Hey, uh, I've been, I've been, I've, I have my three kids are spread out. Um, seven years apart. I have been paying for child care for 21 years now. Um, I'm about I'm about a year or so away so, from finally so, yeah, being you've done. You've got skin in that game. I got skin in the too, game, Rob. I mean, so looking at costs like that, how can we lower those costs? How can we make investments in to uh, mental health care? Because we hear that from so many families that uh, we now recognize that we shouldn't stigmatize mental health, chemical dependency. But where do I take a loved one when they need help? What what can we do to support that as a state? What can we do to keep making sure? Not just our, our cities have good roads and bridges and new interchanges off the interstate. How about those rural roads so our farmers can get their crops uh, to the elevator, get them to market? Those are the kinds of things we talk about in the Democratic Party. And on the tax piece, absolutely. When we have uh, robust reserves, robust revenues like we do now, what can we do to send money right back to taxpayers? I think a, a, a credit uh, that follows on what we almost unanimously supported as a, as a Democratic Party in the 2021 20, special session is the better way uh, to do it rather than a flat tax that I don't like how heavily it weighs in favor of those on the higher end of the income sc uh, scale or like how it boxes us into long-term reduction I, I, in, in state revenue. You know, that almost sounds like a way we could fill in 40,000 more jobs, maybe attract more people to the state of North Dakota. A temporary tax credit? No, gonna, the holistic gonna... package representative okay. just oh, spoke. Oh, so, 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 questions. So he's going to move on to that. So, so, well, no, no. So now, now we could talk about it as holistic and not pretend like the tax code is the only thing we're putting forward to attract people to the state, which I would argue the people in favor of the, the tax reform plan are, are not the same. We only have a few minutes left with representative this, this Ista, who I'm sure is enjoying this right now. I know. Uh, I, I got real uh, long time listener, first time caller vibes <laughs> here. You, you two have spent a lot of time in the car with me, unbeknownst to you driving between Bismarck and Grand Forks. So uh, it's good to be with you. Well, I, I'm, well, sorry I'm, I'm, I'm so passengers uh, in that car. Yeah, I'm so uh, <laughs> I'm so happy to have you on and uh, glad you agreed to come on. I um, I mean, I, I, I agree with it. I just I, I don't I don't think that we're. I don't think one is exclusive of the other. I think we could do this income tax plan and still have the ability to do. I mean, it's all I mean, in the governor's executive budget, which is obviously going to be changed a great deal by by the legislature, because that's the process. Um, I mean, he accounts for both where we do the income tax plan and we make investments in, in child care and we do some of the other things you know that we need to do, because I agree those are areas. I just I think we can walk and chew gum. At the same time, I don't think that these are exclusive from from one another. And uh, and, and the one thing I, I think would would really be a mistake is to do another property tax buy down 
I just I think that's just going to obligate the state to more local spending. It's going to continue to erode the local control that everybody's talking about. I mean, look at look at the bill we had Representative Ruby on. Um, and we're talking about, you know, however, I don't want to start a debate about superintendents, but his bill basically, you know, caps what, what school superintendents can be paid and caps, you know, says that, that some school districts have to share superintendents. And that's proven to be a very controversial. But one of the things that the justifications he's using for that bill is the fact that the, the state now pays the majority of education. So every time we do another one of these property tax buy downs, if you care about local control, you're chipping away at local control because you're giving the state more financial strings they can pull to do things. So, I mean, to me, whatever happens with income tax, I really hope you guys don't do another property tax buy down. I guess that's the point I'm trying to make. I don't think they work. I don't think they're accomplishing anything. Um, it's time for something different. Well, and I think I listened to your interview with, with Representative uh, Ruby, and I think you made a good point about Local uh, uh, school boards, county commissions—they're not. I think you use the phrase "twirling their mustache," figuring out ways to raise that might have been taxes. Me that, either yeah. uh, neither are we here in the legislature. I think everybody wants, as I started, everybody wants their taxes as low as possible ac across the board, and I think we are working to do that. As you mentioned, Rob, every string you start pulling uh, out of this tax puzzle, you see different layers. So we're going to have a long session here. Uh, I've told others this tax debate is one of those we're probably not going to see a resolution on until the last couple weeks of session uh, when the whole puzzle comes together. I, I would just, and, I would, again, I, I would just, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, no one's the bad guy here to yeah. both of your points. People get run for office for the vast, vast majority of people run for office to have the best outcomes for their friends, neighbors, and their community lasting into the future, which is why I appreciate Representative Vista and a loyal opposition uh, fiercely taking down point by point each of the tax plans, especially when it's going to be a major change to yeah. our uh, ta income tax plan. The very top of which I want to remind everyone is 2.9% after you make 430 thousand dollars which i must confess to you gentlemen i fell just short of last year so i've not had that experience yet and if and, 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 and updating that for this tax year it's up to 491 and remember that's taxable income most of us think of our income in terms of, of gross income so mm -hmm. you can add those standard deductions and get a rough approximation i would i would point out, I, I would be lies. just 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 to be clear about where my uh, interests lay i would be in the 40 percent who would continue to pay the tax uh, under this plan um, regardless, and I would also, I mean, getting back to the whole, uh, what's a handout to the rich thing. Again, I would argue if you're going to have a progressive tax code where the people at the top are taxed the most, if you, if you do an across the board reduction, the people at the top are always going to get, I mean, that's, it, that's the way it's designed. They're always going to get more back. So I, I just, I, I don't like that talking point, but I will say one other, and, and we, we don't have enough time really to get into it. I do also worry about freeing too many people from the obligation to pay for their government. Um, I feel like when we start narrowing the tax code down to where too few people are feeling the pain when government gets bigger, right? I always kind of feel taxes should be broad and low, which is everybody pays a little, nobody pays a lot. Because I, I do think everybody from people who aren't making a whole bunch of money or maybe aren't working at all up to the richest people, the government belongs to all of us, right? And so we should all have, we should all feel the burden of it a little bit. And I, I am our, you know, people who are richer, maybe they should carry more burden than people who are poor. I, I think I don't have a problem with that. 2.9 versus 2.01 right now really is the main difference in our tax code. It's not that much more. It's, it's more. And I think it's an appropriate amount more. So I don't, oh, well, actually, I don't actually, actually I'm making an argument it, against the plan, which frees 60% of the people from not paying the income tax at all. Mm -hmm. um, you know, maybe that's an argument against the plan. I do think we need to be careful about not, um, I guess unshackling to be government should belong to all of us. I guess that's my point. And, and one of our connections to the government of the taxes we pay. So uh, here I am rebutting my own position on the tax code. Representative Vista, thanks so much for your time. Oh, I think actually we, we may have lost him. Uh, I think he got oh, disconnected. So uh, we are, yeah, he just texted me. He got disconnected. Anyway, we were done with the interview, so we'll end it there and uh, move on to the next one. Hi there, my name is James Walner. I produce and host the podcast Dakota Spotlight, a true crime podcast that tackles historical and unsolved crimes in the upper Midwest. Follow along with me as we search for a missing girl, attempt to solve a 45-year-old murder, and much, much more. That's Dakota Spotlight Podcast anywhere you get your podcasts or at inform.com slash podcasts. 
Okay, welcome back. If, if it was a little awkward there ending that last interview, it's because um, Representative Vista was at the state capitol in the minority leader's office recording the interview with us. And uh, the Capitol's internet had a little hiccup there, uh, which also led to a delay in us starting the interview with our next guest, who was also in the state Capitol, uh, Insurance Commissioner John Gottfried. And he's on to talk to Ben and I about a proposal for prescription drug prices, which, you know, if, if there's one thing that, that draws as much consternation in North Dakota as property taxes, it's prescription drug prices, um, which I'm, well, so Ben's got an interjection there. What's and Rob, actually, yeah, sorry to interrupt you, but I actually think it'd be a really good thing to start our audience out with. Could we just have uh, Commissioner Godfrey tell folks just really quick what his purview as an insurance commissioner is? Yeah. Because I think that's a good setting for the conversation. Sure. A lot of folks don't just happen to know, you know, insurance commissioner must be insurance. But like, what does that mean? Commissioner Godfrey, thanks for coming on. If you could do a two minute for us. Yeah, yeah. good point. Let's yeah. start there. Thanks, Rob. Thanks, Ben. And, and we are one of the best kept secrets in the in the state, I think. Um, you know, our, our primary responsibility is consumer advocacy. We work a lot with consumers on dealing with insurance problems. So uh, like I always say, if there's there's no dumb questions when it comes to insurance. So if you've got an issue with your insurance company, your agent, uh, really any questions around insurance, give our office a call. It's a it's a service we provide to the North Dakota citizens to answer those questions. So that, that's what I like to say. Our primary responsibility is to step in the shoes of consumers when you negotiate with an insurance company on a claim, on a process, on, on anything like that. Because the reality is, is you're at a big disadvantage if you call up, you know, State Farm, Blue Cross, whoever, whoever you're having an issue with. Um, if you call them up and say, hey, you guys aren't treating me fairly, they deal with that on a daily basis. That's, that's their job. And you're likely dealing with it in the middle of what could be one of the worst days of your life. You got into a car wreck, you know, have a family member who's sick. You've got some, some major issue, a home, home issue. Absolutely. And so we like to stand in those shoes of the consumers and advocate on their behalf and negotiate to make sure they're getting treated fairly. So that's that's number one. We also regulate the companies within the state that do business here. So making sure that they're solvent and, and ha have the money to be able to pay the claims that may come forward. We also regulate all the agents that are in the state. So they've got to get a licensure through our office and they got to take an exam and do continued education. And then there's a number of, of legal aspects too, just enforcing the laws that are passed by the legislature to make sure that, you know, one, our insurance industry is 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 up and running and it's doing it's doing the best it can. Insurance is very interesting to me and, and I'm I may be biased, um, but it's it's one of the last truly state based regulatory schemes. Uh, so in the late early 80s, late 70s, Congress passed the McCarran Ferguson Act, which deferred all all insurance regulation to the states. Now they've taken some of that back in the flood insurance space and the health insurance space a little bit but primarily the states are the lead regulators on insurance. So that's what makes this legislative session and the things that happen in the Capitol here so very important to our insurance industry because it's truly directed by the laws that are made by our legislators. Just, just one more real quick, Rob. Is your position as an insurance commissioner, you are elected and you're elected with partisan uh, endorsements. Like you have, you got an endorsement from the Republican Party. You have Democratic opponents and Libertarian, whoever else would want to run for you. How common is your position as an elected position statewide across the country? Or is it oftentimes under the purview of appointment of a governor? Can you speak to that? So there are 56 different insurance commissioners across, the, across our, our country, right? So that's all the states and the territories. So every state or territory has some sort of lead insurance regulator because it's a state-based system. Uh, there are 12 of us that are elected, uh, primarily from the Midwest. A lot of us in the Midwest are, are elected. Um, majority of them are appointed by the governor as part of the cabinet. There are a handful like a, like a Virginia or a Florida, and I think there's maybe a few other that are appointed by some kind of nonpartisan board, like a commerce board or, or Florida is really interesting. They've got the, it's basically their industrial commission down in Florida appoints that insurance commissioner role. So it's really unique. I'll tell you, I mean, it's, it's making insurance partisan is pretty difficult. It's, it's at the end of the day, it's math. Um, that's what it really comes down to. Either the math works or it doesn't. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it is a unique elected position where you've got to go out and, and, and kind of talk about what's going on in the space. And, and what, again, a lot of people don't necessarily know we exist or know what we do or haven't had an interaction with the insurance department. So I, I like that it's an independently elected office. I don't have to report to the governor. I don't have to, you know, I can, I can independently take action. I think that's part of what our state is founded on. We elect just everything, everything in North Dakota. So <laughs> yes, I like do. that it brings. Um, but, you know, again, there's also probably some benefits from being appointed. I just don't know what those are. Yeah. As, as the anti-populist on the podcast, we could have a whole show about the number Absolutely. of people that we elect, but that's, we'll do a whole different show on that. So the reason why we wanted, or uh, we wanted Commissioner uh, Godfrey on today is Senate Bill 2031. And you're going to, you've probably already heard a lot about this. It's got a big push behind it from uh, the AARP, among other interests. 
And essentially what it would do, it, it starts a pilot program, but but the pilot program has the intent of, of, of putting us in a position where this would be sort of the, the situation for everybody. Uh, but mm -hmm. the pilot program would be for state employees through the PERS program. And essentially what it would do is it would say um, that it would, it would cap prescription drug prices and it would use as a reference point uh, the the caps that are used in, in four specific provinces in Canada, Quebec, Alberta, Ontario, and British Columbia. And it would it would say that that drug companies cannot offer prescription drugs above those, I think it euphemistically calls them reference prices, but above those capped prices. And it also makes it illegal for the for the companies to withdraw or stop offering those drugs in our state if they don't like those prices. Um, and I think, uh, first of all, I, I guess I, I'm, I've already written a couple of columns about this. So maybe people know what I think. Commissioner Goffrey, what, what do you think of this bill? Well, I, I think anytime you start talking about a, a drug price caps or a price gap of any nature, you're, you may run into some issues. And, and I think this pilot project that it calls for is it's really focusing on the 25 highly utilized drugs within the PERS program. Uh, just off the bat, the main concern that I have with that is if, if, if I'm putting a, a price control on those 25 drugs, they may not be available in our state. And, and you know, if, I, if I'm a drug manufacturer, a wholesaler or a distributor or whatever you want to call it, I may take those drugs off the market because I don't, I can, I, we're North Dakota, we, for good, for better, for worse, we're North Dakota. Um, you know, you're going to maybe not invest that much into that marketplace if it's, if it's a challenge, right? So you may take those off. There is a portion of the law that says you can't do that. We've got some significant questions around the authority and who who and who enforces that. It, it's designated. I'm, I'm, from I'm wondering if that's constitutional. Like, can you go to a farmer and say, "Listen, uh, we're only going to pay you two dollars, uh, whatever, for your wheat, uh, and it's illegal for you to stop growing wheat." Um, I feel like farmers might have a problem with that. Yeah, I would say there's there's definitely some constitutionality issues with that. I think everything's presumed constitutional until it's challenged. So, I mean, you know, we'll, I'll let the Supreme Court justice to make that determination. Well, and but I think, I think you get back to who enforces it. I don't have any authority over drug manufacturers, drug wholesalers, really anything. I, I enforce insurance laws. I enforce insurance carriers. And when you get in, start spreading out that authority, if I were to send to a, a drug manufacturer and say, hey, you've stopped selling one of these 25 drugs because you didn't like the price that's coming, here's your fine. They're very likely to say, who are you? And we don't care. Uh, then, Commissioner, oh, go ahead. No, please go. Commissioner Godfrey, to your first point about those 25, you said it was the most, uh, for lack of a better term, popular, most used. Yeah, highly products. utilized. Yeah. Highly utilized. There we go. That's a better term for it. Have you had any contacts with representatives or seen press releases or seen official declarations from pharmaceutical companies stating that if this were implemented, they would cease to be part of the market in North Dakota? Because I know those uh, interests look very closely at legislation and do make pro and against statements. Do you have they made those statements? Do they would they have they been on the record saying they'd be they'd willingly take hundreds of thousands potentially of customers out of their purview? Well, I, I, I think you can look at the opposition testimony that was outlined in the hearing. I think they all lined up and made this similar concern. They raised a similar concern. Now, what could happen is it may change to a different type of drug that does a similar outcome. I mean, there, there's a lot of different classes of drugs that do that treat similar things. Um, does it is it as effective? Do the side effects different or what does this mean? I, I'm not a pharmaceutical expert by any stretch of the imagination. Sure thing. Um, but and, I don't mean to be flippant, but generics have helped a lot of people uh, with their financial situation deliver the same results. Obviously, it needs to be carefully regulated for the science and how those medicines impact one's body. But if that is the result, do you really view that as a negative? No, I mean, I think the more we can we can unleash generics is, is a good thing for the healthcare system. I'm just not an expert in knowing what that difference is between the name brand and the generic drug. I'm not, I'm not an expert in knowing sure. if, if this... If this name brand drug has a different side effect or have a different outcome or different whatever, whatever that is, I don't know that. And I'm just I think I'm, I think I, and you feel this bill would make that your responsibility under the insurance department, insurance commissioner's department. It, rather? it levies that pretty, pretty squarely with me to enforce the, yeah. the this law. And, and I that's where our concern is. We don't have the enforcement capability. And then as a follow up to that, then I hear you and I saw the quote and I can't remember either the Bismarck Tribune or the forum, but I saw you quoted as saying that you understood that drug prices were something that need to be addressed, but you didn't have the capacity and you didn't particularly. And what you're saying now is you don't feel 
it appropriate for that to fall on the insurance commissioner's jurisdiction. What I worry about, and I'll just I'll be upfront about it, is this is an urgent, this price point has been urgent for consumers in the state of North Dakota. You're hearing it and you're studying it right now, and I, I know you see that. If the thing that is used to kill this piece of legislation is where it lives, I fear that nothing gets done this session and then it's another 20 months because we have session every other year before something's done at a state level if it can be done. Is there something you would be uh, amicable to that would put this bill somewhere somewhere else where we could in invoke these kind of lower drug prices? Because it should be noted, this is this bill is not sponsored by one legislator. This bill is sponsored by um, legislative management, which to translate that into human, means a large group of legislators meeting frequently over the course of the interim. And very frankly, some very conservative legislators that don't typically like government intervention saying, we are hearing from this too much. Our representative Lisa Meyer, very conservative Republican for Bismarck saying, I'm hearing far too much about this. And the rate that, you know, if you compare how insulin's gone up, or I don't know if that's including one of the 25 drugs you're talking about, if you did that and you put on milk, eggs, gas, any other consumer prices, there'd be an absolute uproar. So action's needed. Where do you think the air in that balloon could go to if it doesn't, if that purview shouldn't lie in the insurance commissioner's department? Well, I, I appreciate the question because we've been thinking about this for a number of years. I mean, I think you talk about PBM legislation, which is pharmaceutical benefit managers is another piece that's often come up. Um, it, it often gets defaulted to, well, let's, the insurance, insurance commissioner office has, they touch health insurance, which is ancillary related. So we've made the, we've made the pitch. Uh, nobody's taken me up on it yet. Um, Okay. But to look at our board of pharmacy, um, mm -hmm. and, and perhaps our, it's time for our board of pharmacy to evolve into a, a true state agency. I imagine at some point in time, you know, it's a, it's a, right now it's a licensure board. We license people as well. We're a state agency. We're an independent operation. At some you point, license insurance agents. And insurance people agents, right? Insurance. And Correct. so the board of pharmacy licensed pharmacists. So it may, it may be behoove at some point to turn that board of pharmacy into an actually pharmacy agency or pharmacy you know, something of a, maybe put under DHHS or something like that, where they're in charge of licensing and regulating the pharmaceutical industry within our state. They would then be able to have the expertise to look at whether this is a good idea or not. I, I, I don't, I mean, I can speak to price caps and price controls generally and what that maybe does. You squeeze a balloon somewhere, it's going to pop out somewhere else that you may not, you may not intend. We've got some issues with, again, the, uh, the enforcement of it. I don't have any enforcement authority over the pharmaceutical manufacturers. I've got concerns about you know, one, even the, the pure expertise of operating this is we, we put a fiscal note of $3.1 million on it. And I know people often kill bills by fiscal note, and I, and I understand that. We had this, we sent this out to an independent group to say, we don't know anything. We don't know enough about this. What does this mean? And they came back with, to effectively run this program, you need, you need two more FTEs at least, and then probably about 5,000 hours of consultant time to manage this program and be able to handle the enforcement, handle the pieces. And so it, it feels like we're trying to cram a, a square peg into a round hole in this in our office. And I and I like I said, I've talked for for the last two sessions on maybe even studying what does it look like to turn the Board of Pharmacy into an agency to, to provide the expertise in this space where you could have PBM regulation, you could have pharmaceutical regulation, you could look at you know other pharmacist issues. This just gets dangerously close to um, I don't have regulatory authority, and not that I don't think the state would want to give it to me. I don't know if I necessarily want it to be able to regulate providers. I'm on the insurance space. I regulate the insurance companies and their contracting, what they do for our consumers. When you start getting into that provider space of it's hospitals, pharmacies, pharmacists, whatever you wanna talk about, that takes another level of expertise that I simply do not have. I hate to say that because I think I'm generally good at a lot of, a lot of things, but it's, it's a very complex world very, very quickly. And lastly, the piece is that this, and, and Rob mentioned this, this is likely going to uh, end up in court. I think I think a lot of these type of legislation they often find their ways to the court system, and and we're in the middle of a lawsuit right now on a long term care issue, a long term care insurance issue, which is separate. But when it becomes these larger lawsuits and the state and the state has to defend itself or or initiate the lawsuit, we often have to engage the attorney general. And as a special funded agency, which means we collect we collect revenue more than we 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 spend, so we're specially funded. I then get billed by the attorney general for that time. And so we've got another piece in there of, of covering those those legal costs that may happen. So there's, it, it just, again, it gets down to, it feels like a square peg in a round hole. I think there may be a better option. My, I've, I've been pitching the board of pharmacy, let, let them grow up into a pharmaceutical agency of some kind and make investments there because clearly this is an issue that isn't going away. 
and I and I don't disagree with the intention of the bill. Uh, we see the drug, we we see the pharmaceutical spend on the healthcare cost side. We see what it means going into insurance premiums, and it's significantly it's it's rising faster than inflation. It's rising faster than general healthcare costs. Yeah, it's that's breaking driver. some people who are otherwise financially solvent. It, it's lead, it's the lead driver in, in in a lot of our healthcare expense. But I again, some of this has to do with Congress. Some of this has to do with with probably other pieces. Um, I'm just not sure I, I've got the expertise to to really look into what this means to regulate pharmaceutical manufacturing, wholesaling, distributing, and ultimately down to the pharmacist and that interaction. Well, I, I worry about it You know, from, from a federalist point of view. I mean, not just the authority of your office to oversee this. I worry about the state of North Dakota uh, in our authority as a state to regulate effectively interstate commerce, which the Constitution assigns to Congress. I also worry that, that the problem doesn't have its roots in North Dakota. I mean, even if you let the Board of Pharmacy grow up, it doesn't change the fact, the reality of the, the global pharmaceutical market, because it's a global market. These these companies that we're dealing with are, are multinational conglomerates in, in a lot of ways. What's driving a lot of it are the policies in other countries. Uh, America has become the pressure relief valve for prescription drug prices because places like Canada and the United Kingdom and Japan and these other places they put their caps in and but somebody's still got to pay for the research and development and I know nobody wants to hear about this because nobody wants to be sympathetic to the drug companies and frankly I'm not that sympathetic to the drug companies but the reality is it costs billions to bring a drug to market and that cost has to come from somewhere and so what happens is when Canada and Great Britain and all these other places cap the prices, they make up for it in the United States market, and which makes me think that the, the solution for this has to come for Congress, both because drugs within the United States are an interstate commerce issue and because a lot of it has to do with what other countries are doing with their policies, and there's probably some treaties or something that we need to work out with them to try to level out drug prices across the globe into something a lot more reasonable than what they are. Now, whether or not Canada or these others are going to play ball to help the domestic American drug market, I don't know. I understand what a quandary that is, and I understand that none of this really makes anybody happy, but I don't see this as a problem that the North Dakota legislature could solve. I think the only thing that we could do, would, frankly, is, is make it worse, which I think this bill would do. And I think you're seeing that too, Rob, and I, I think this has been a, a, an issue that Congress has been facing and been pressured on for decades at least or more and people are sick of not seeing a real solution exactly and 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 under, understandably so i, I am not it's going I, it, up. it is not my intent to besmirch or to undermine anybody's outrage about drug prices i get it you should be mad and so now now it's filtering down to the state level because they couldn't get action at congress and and we're seeing it in the insurance space too you've got a, a, more more so on the pbm side you've had a number of states kind of take action and 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 authorize the insurance commissioner in their state to have more authority over pharmaceutical benefit managers which is a piece of the system that's probably got a, got some issues. I think everybody, nobody's nobody has clean hands necessarily in this whole system. Um, but I think we've seen in other states, there's been significant investment in an Oklahoma, a Montana, uh, Kentucky, who have invested heavily into the space and have not seen that change. Because again, you squeeze a balloon, it pops out somewhere else. And then you, you always get into that regulatory authority issue where you're expanding authority of one office that maybe doesn't have uh, that that true nature would be able to go enforce those policies and or enforce those fines or enforce that enforce that activity. So you're left with somebody saying, and this is what I've cautioned my insurance commissioner friends across the country of: if we raise our hand and say we are we are going to be pharmacy benefit managers or pharmaceutical managers, we are then going to be when when this when this doesn't when the problem isn't solved, we've also then got the take the issue of of saying, hey, we gave the insurance commissioner the authority to lower drug prices, our drug prices didn't go down. And that yeah. that's an, that becomes an issue then. And and you said in Kentucky, in which state was it again? Oklahoma. Oklahoma's got a pre. Kentucky and Oklahoma. They gave it to who? The insurance there? commissioner. And that's on the, the that's on the CBM it. side. That's a, that's a little bit of a separate issue, but. Got it. And I know it's different per state for sure. Yeah. Uh, and no no one state insurance agency or such looks the same, which is part of you know our laboratories of democracy, as cornballs as it sounds. It is actually a strength of the system, despite the frustrations it can bring up. So no no uh, fingers being pointed at you there. Commissioner Godfrey, what you were saying before about the pharmacy board and the fact that no one's taking you up on it makes a lot of sense to me. If I'm sitting in one of those uh, legislative seats, I'm hearing you at the beginning of session, taking you up on that, running the legislative council and saying, draft that bill, but swap out uh, Godfrey's department for pharmacy board. Let's see where it goes. Let's roll the dice and compete with these proposals. Now, legislative management decided to put this on 
you. So kind of a dual question. Why is no one taking you up on that? It would seem to make a lot of sense to me to throw it into the arena to see. And why did legislative management come to you? Because you're you're an attentive person. I know that you watch these things and I know you're at those meetings. Why did they decide to put that on you when you have this stance? Well, I, I, and the reality of your office too, yeah. not, yeah. And this this is a stance that we haven't shied away from. I mean, we were we were through the interim, the healthcare interim committee where this bill came out of that you mentioned the legislative management and human speak, that, that's the interim committee. Um, we made these cases here, but I think ultimately it's because they don't know where else to put it. And I think you'll see, you've seen other states look at, again, the pharmacy benefit manager piece, which is ancillary related. And they say, well, insurance commissioners in a couple states have maybe tried to take this on. Yeah. And it, again, I, we, we've been very consistent in our, in our discussion on this. Like, I don't have the expertise. You're going to have to give me, you have to give me that grown up pharmacy manager, pharmacy board in my office, which is a significant expansion of our, of our, duties and resources, or it's got to go somewhere else. Well, and you're giving a real solution to what my concern was, which is if it doesn't wonder if a solution to it is a universally is widely acknowledged to be a real problem with urgency is the solution happens to be the right thing, maybe put in the wrong place. If no one's taking up on that, then I'm going to poke you a little bit further and say, are there individual legislators who are preventing this or put it, who have a strong opinion? Who Who is it that is doing this? Because legislative management is made up of legislators. So who is it behind this? I have, I, I don't know who's actually, who's necessarily behind not taking up on the, on the growth of the pharmacy, uh, pharmacy board. Um, my guess is it probably has something to do. It'd be creating a new agency. It'd be kind of that growth in government uh, aspect. Um, but which, again, which is ironic, know. given that given that the bill we're discussing are literally government price controls. If we're concerned about growth in government, maybe we could start there. Well, yeah, I think a more holistic approach would defeat. We're, we're at times a little. Sure what you're saying, Commissioner Godfrey, that that might be what's talked about in committee, but I'd at some point that has to come to a head, and someone has to be making those decisions on putting it on you. And when you've been now pretty clear with your opposition and where it should go, I'm really afraid this is going to die, and people are going to continue to have these drug prices. I'm not saying that we have a magic yeah. silver bullet solution here, but just because the problem doesn't come from North Dakota doesn't mean North Dakota can't be an example of how to deal with it on a state level that helps guide. Congress, how to act and back and forth. That's the whole blessed point of the system. And if it just dies here with a, th that to me amounts to a do nothing. And that's incredibly frustrating on the part of the I, consumer. I, I don't disagree with you. Um, you know, I think the, some of the testimony that was given by the AARP members in this hearing was very persuasive. I mean, the, the trips to Mexico, the trips to, to, to Canada. going to, buy, to Canada to buy these prescription drugs no. at, at dollars on the pennies. And again, that, that gets into some of Rob's point that there are different policies in those different countries that have effectuated this. But it, it, it is, I mean, these are real world issues that are affecting North Dakotans. Um, again, I want to make sure that if we do do something like this, that it's actually effective and doesn't have any really big unintended consequences on the other side. And that's big. That's been my main concern the whole time is you give this to us. I don't think we can be effective with it. And ultimately, I think, you know, the, the other fear is if we do this and it fails, you may just say, well, we can't do anything about it. And we stop trying. Exactly. And so I'm hoping that that somebody will take me up on this. I don't get to write the legislation, as you know, Ben. I don't. I, you, you've been in this, in this, this, yeah. this building before. Um, you know, I, I don't try to write that legislation. They, you <laughs> I, don't know, do, no, I don't get to do this stuff. So uh, it, it's up to our policymakers to make these determinations. And uh, we think we've brought forward a, a, a pretty reasonable idea a couple of years ago with this. Uh, and, and even so, talking with Mark Hardy, who's the director of the Board of Pharmacy, I, I told him before a hearing. I said, Mark, I'm going to come out. And I'm going to. I'm going to lay it out that you should be the, you should, you, there should be a new agency and you should be the head of it. And he's, and after talking about it for a couple months, he kind of, he got there. I mean, he's like, okay, let's make some sense. We can be a licensing agency and, and become an independent agency versus having pharmacies, pharmacists license themselves. Right. So you got a board of pharmacists yeah. made up of pharmacists. You're licensing those pharmacists. Now there's always some inherent. That's a whole there. other podcast yep. worth yep. of businesses self-licensing themselves and what can well, go into that, which you don't need to speak to. But I, I completely agree. If we're going to have the debates about some of the legislation we've seen, and I'm not going to name specifics because they aren't bills you're bringing up, uh, Commissioner Godfrey, but if we're going to have debates on those things. We at the very least could have a debate about whether reducing drug prices should exist in your department, pharmacy board or somewhere else. And to only have one option is... I will say I'm very disappointed in that. I'm disappointed no one's taking you up on that when you're making a clear alternative offer like that. I well, just, ultimately, I think too is, is part of our discussion with this. We've we've laid the we've laid the roadmap for if if they want to pass it and put it in the insurance department, if ultimately that's what they want to do, 
you know, we're going to need two additional employees. And, and I'm, I'm going to have a, I'm honestly going to struggle hiring those folks because they're going to have to be experts in pharmacy or pharmacy law or pharmaceutical management. That's a unicorn in some, some respects. I feel like those people make a lot of money too. <laughs> you can definitely pay them six figure corporate uh, fortune 500 wages, right? Yeah. They make, they make more than, than, than I think probably the three of us combined. Um, but, uh, and, and then also having access to consultants to be able to, to offer it, to direct this through and, and implement it. Our, our number is 3.1. That's what we got from an independent firm that looked at this. We believe that's, that's again, not knowing what this all entails. That's what we believe is, is fairly accurate. So if this, if, if the legislature ultimately says, you know what, we're going to do this and we're going to give it to John, we, we do have a, a roadmap on how to do it. My concern is, is it going to be effective? Do we have the proper authority? And ultimately when, when the state gets sued on this, I want to make sure that I, we got attorney general, general Wrigley up there, uh, defending this, not, you know, not well, our well, also that, that he hasn't handled law that is defensible because again, yeah. I am not, cons I am not at all convinced that the state of North Dakota has the authority to regulate interstate commerce has the authority. I, I am very skeptical of tying, uh, our policy to, to what policy is being set in Canada. I don't think we should be exporting those decisions. So I, I just, I have a lot of problems. I don't, I, I, again, I understand that we're kind of in a, well, we got to do something because everybody's really mad about this issue. So we got to do something, but that doesn't mean just do anything. It's yep. got to be something that's lawful. It's got to be something that's defensible and it's got to be something that works. And I'm just not convinced that we have a lot of that's really going to get at the root of the prescription drug problem that we really have anything that we could do in North Dakota. Now, there may be some things we could do on the margins. I agree with that. And I'm open to those ideas. But the root of this problem is national and international. And that is way beyond the scope of the state of North Dakota. I'm my, extremely, my opinion. I'm very I'm glad there is a bill discussing an urgent need that's impacting everybody's uh, pocketbook right now. I'm very disappointed there's not multiple bills for multiple routes being having robust uh, and thorough debate. We have multiple bills on other, mm -hmm. frankly, BS side issue, social issue uh, debates that I will not drag Commissioner Gottfried in on. But when you don't have those multiple options, it goes to the legislators, it goes to the authors. And that's that's a big letdown for the people in the state of North Dakota. I'm that's very disappointing. Well, there there are still bills rolling out on the calendar. Um, there you know I know there's there's some some issues with with you know releasing those bills uh, through legislative council at times, but uh, the senators still have until Friday I think to introduce bills, and so there's mm. there's still an option. Um, but uh, it's it's uh, I, I don't disagree with you. I think this is I think that's part of the problem though. I think we we've, we've looked at this issue for a number of sessions and we we've attacked the the PBM side of it, and North Dakota is part of a pretty monumental. Uh, pharmacy benefit manager lawsuit. Uh, the Rutledge decision and the Weeby decision have have really expanded Absolutely. some legal pieces within that that ERISA plan and what that does. And so there's some options mm -hmm. there um, that we we've, we've explored. Um, but I think again it gets to part of Rob points. Rob's point is it's really hard to craft state legislation to solve this problem when it when it. I I tend to agree with Rob that it's it's often more of a federal issue. It's more of a, a congressional issue. And I think the people. All across the country are so frustrated with their with Congress and the inaction in Congress that now they're they're bleeding and, into the state. And the right, state right, right, rightfully so. Hundred percent. And now they're looking for action to be taken up. So yeah. I get it. Uh, all right. Well, we'll end it there, Commissioner Godfrey. Thanks for your time. Thanks, Rob. Thanks, Ben. Did you know Forum Communications Company has a robust podcast library? at inform.com forward slash podcasts. We have everything from politics, sports, true crime, outdoor adventure, and more. Visit inform.com forward slash podcasts and explore them all today.